Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day three of the Hack Summit. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time today, this is a virtual conference for programmers where we're going to be learning from some of the masters of programming. And we are so blessed here to have Yehuda Katz, who is the creator of, of the Handlebars plus maintainer of Ember.js, as well as a uh, core committer to Ruby on Rails with us today. Uh, I met Yehuda back at RailsConf this year. Um, where I was extremely impressed by his keynote. Uh, he runs, a, he's a co-founder of a company called Tilda, which is both a product and a consulting company, specializing in Rails and Ember and other technologies. And they have built a product, which is a Rails performance monitoring product and profiling product. And you can learn more about that at skylight.io, S-K-Y-L-I-G-H-T dot I-O. Um, and Rehuda is, is extremely famous in, in both the Rails and the Ember kind of community. He received a Ruby Heroes Award at RailsConf in 2008. He previously worked at Engine Yard, Strobe, and Google. And he's the co-author of jQuery in Action and Rails 3 on Action. So we're very, very lucky to have him here today. Yehuda, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Great. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, just make a couple announcements before we get started. So um, audience members, you can ask and answer questions using the Q&A panel here. We encourage you to ask as many questions uh, as you wish. The most intelligent questions naturally get bubbled to the top based on audience votes. And the audience members that ask uh, the most, the questions that get the most votes, the number one audience member uh, will receive a, a one hour mentoring session with one of the participating speakers uh, in 2015. And so try to ask very intelligent questions here. And so I'll be back, Yehuda, after your, your address and we'll go back into those Q&A. So Yehuda, take it away whenever you're ready. Perfect. I'm just going to quickly screen share here. Whoa. Inception. OK, so uh, good morning, everybody. I know it's many thousands of people here. And also, I can't really see what anyone's doing. So hopefully, I'll stay connected, and you guys will keep hearing me. I'll let you know if anything's a problem, but it looks great so far, Yehuda. Awesome, perfect. Uh, so this is an early talk, so I kind of wanted to start the day talking a little bit about um, theory, in particular my theory on how to build an open source project that lasts, that's effective. I noticed some people ask questions about this in the Q&A, so maybe I'll preemptively answer uh, my opinion about open source. Um, and I kind of have to go back to 2008, 2009, 2010, which is when I was working on Rails. Before I worked on Rails, I was working on a project called Merb, which was a, a Rails competitor. And I was working at Engine Yard, um, like he said. And one thing that was awesome about that time period was that I was living in what I felt at the time was a golden opportunity. I was working full time, first on Merb and then on Rails. I essentially got to do whatever I wanted uh, as long as I was doing something that was useful for the community that I, I felt was adding value. Um, we had a really big time frame, so we did this merge from Merb into Rails, and we had not forever, but I, we ended up, I think, spending 18 months working on Rails 3. So it felt really great. It felt like I had finally reached the pinnacle of my career. And I remember around 12 months in, so we worked on Rails 3 for a long time. Around 12 months in, I remember vi vividly, and this is probably the most vivid recollection I have of this time period, uh, sitting in the Rails chat room, and DHH asked me, so Yehuda, what app are you working on today? Or what app are you working on around now? And I got pretty upset at him at the time. And the reason I got upset was I felt like I'm working on open source full time. I'm doing all this work to help the community. But, and you're asking me like to work on something else. Like how do I have time to work on something else? Where is where's this time supposed to come from? And I remember being pretty upset for maybe even a month or two months. But eventually I came to realize that he was basically right. Um, and in particular, what I mean by this is that if you're working on open source projects, initially when you first start working on open source, when you first get the golden opportunity, you have a lot of, uh, you have a lot of pain in your belly. You have a lot of things that you want to get fixed. So you take all these real world experience and you go and you fix it. And that what makes, that's what makes open source so great. And then over a certain period of time, if you're working on open source in a comfortable, good job like that, what ends up happening is you lose perspective on what is actually painful, and you start shifting into uh, working on big, ambitious, boil the ocean problems on things that you find personally interesting. So in, sort, in retrospect, um, the fact that I was working full-time on Rails, I can 
definitely remember a switch in my feeling from when I was working hard and in a disciplined way on problems that I knew, that I felt in my gut, to working on sort of intellectually interesting, hard problems that were ambitious but without really shipping. Um, so I'll start by saying I, I think this is probably, for me, a pretty important thing about open source is that if you're working full-time on open source, if you're one of the few people that has the luxury of doing that or if you know someone doing that, I would say definitely take some time out of your day, every day or every week, to work on a real app that you maintain. Um, even if it's 20% time, that, that will bring a lot of value. And I don't know if I realized this at the time, but that story, that me realizing that not working on a real app was really damaging my ability to understand what I was doing as a, as a developer, it was kind of a pivotal moment for me. Um, it changed the way I had previously been thinking about what it means to be successful in open source. And what I mean by that is that before I did this, I previously thought that the main, the big problem in open source, and I've heard a lot of people talk about this problem, was there's so many good ideas that everyone has, and it seems like really the problem is how do you find funding for, to make these ideas real? So we have all these ideas, a lot of people have them, people know what to do, and really all we need to do is find funding. But there's another problem that sort of comes into contrast to this problem, which is that the best open source, if you think about the most successful best open source in the world, it comes from a lot of perspectives, not just one small group, not just one company. Um, it comes from a lot of perspectives working together to evolve a shared solution. And unfortunately, if you're spending all your time working on a single project, uh, or basically full-time working on an open source project, you actually don't have that many good insights into actually using the project. So you know a lot about how the project works, you know a lot about the internals, what's fast and slow, what things need to be refactored, but you slowly lose track of what it feels like to use the product. And further, even if you're scratching your own itch or your company's itch, your personal itch, you actually really want the big decisions of an open source project to be made by a big group of people that have a whole bunch of different use cases. So um, I'm coining this term indie open source, and what I mean by indie open source is open source that's built around principles of decision making, decision making authority, uh, made by a loose coalition of companies and individuals who share a vision, they share an idea of what it is that they want to do, but they don't necessarily share a workplace. In fact, it's better if they don't share a workplace. What's great about indie open source, what I think is, is awesome about this model, is that it's extraordinarily resilient to the kind of big changes that happen at any one big company. And in, what I mean by that is twofold. Number one, uh, sometimes open source uh, centric companies just can get bought. So I remember when Postgres, when MySQL got bought, Postgres wrote this big, big seminal blog post that I think uh, really shaped my feelings on the matter. And Postgres said, MySQL is, is an open source company and you thought you could trust them, but look, they ended up getting bought and now Oracle controls MySQL. But Postgres is different. Postgres has all these different employees and all these different, uh, all these different uh, contributors at all these different companies and you can't really own the direction of Postgres. So that, that's one aspect. Um, having a bunch of different people at different companies means that the decision making is diffuse and can't, you can't necessarily own it. But it also means that they're resistant to sudden changes in direction at any given company. So you might have a company that was very interested in some open source project and then for whatever reason um, the company's direction changes and all of a sudden they need to make huge shifts in the project. And if you have decision making that's spread out over a bigger group of people, any one big shift in a company's process can't really change the uh, the mode that the company, that the project is operating in. It requires a, a bigger systemic change across the entire ecosystem. So let me be a little bit more concrete. So that was sort of a generic idea of uh, having diffuse, uh, having having diffusion of, of ownership and decision making. I want to talk a little bit about what I mean exactly. And I'm going to use as an example the Ember project. And obviously it should be clear that a lot of the ideas that I have around building good open source projects have come from open source projects I've been involved in, I think most notably Rails and jQuery, um, but many of these ideas are things that I've been working really hard at bringing to the Ember project, so forgive me if I use Ember as an example of many times here. Um, so if you look at the Ember project, uh, Tilda was the company where Ember essentially originated. Um, so you can see that there's a bunch of people from Tilda that work on it, but actually not a majority. So a minority of the, of the Ember core team is is Tilda. And at Tilda we do a bunch of things. I think because we have some a little bit more of a leadership BDFL kind of role, me and Tom, we actually do a lot of different things. So we do consulting, we do our own app, which gives us a sense of 
maintainership, like I said before. Um, but we also do some training, so we get a, a sense of the of the beginner experience, and that's something that we do at, at our company. So that's our perspective, right? And then you have Trek, who spends his time at Groupon, and Groupon is really interesting because Groupon has all these different teams do, using all these different kinds of open source projects, and Trek can really see very clearly, and, and I would say at face-to-face uh, -face meetings, he's the voice of, uh, let me tell you why all these other projects are super popular inside of Groupon. So he can really, he can give us a perspective on adoption, why Ember may or may not be successful inside of Groupon compared to other projects, and also the benefits of Ember to teams that are changing composition over time. Uh, then you have Eric. Eric actually doesn't really work at any company. He's just a standalone guy, and so he basically travels around and he has this really broad perspective as an evangelist um, and trainer and things like this. Um, Yap was one of the first companies that ever got involved in Ember, and they build a mobile app. And I don't work on a mobile app, so the hardcore performance constraints of mobile apps is not necessarily something that I personally um, feel in my gut. I sort of understand intellectually, but I don't really feel it in my belly. And having people whose you know their product and their job is dependent on making sure that Ember can maintain can maintain good performance in that environment, that ends up being something that they bring to the table every time we have a discussion about direction. Um, then there's uh, Alex, who recently started a company called Express Checkout. And Express Checkout is a greenfield app. It's very much in the trenches. It's very much you know agile, go out and, and bang the doors down to get customers. And that's a, a, a even different kind of perspective. Um, and then finally, Robert actually, Robert Jackson works on a whole bunch of different applications uh, from greenfield apps to rescue projects or consultancy. So he has also a really broad view on the impact of these changes over a wide range of applications. And Robert, <laughs> At any given meeting, Robert is probably the hardest line on compatibility. So uh, whenever I go in and I say, you know, I have this idea, but I think we need to break compatibility in 2.0, Robert's the most likely person to push back. So we have all these different perspectives. And, and what this means in practice is that any particular decision that we make as a team has to go through the gauntlet of all these individual interests. And everybody at the table has essentially uh, has the same level of, of decision making, has the same role. Uh, there's a cons essentially consensus process, and so no any one individual or any one company can come through and ram a decision through that will have a negative impact on a big constituency, just because there's so many different interests that are represented on the core team. And I've actually been involved in a lot of kinds of open source projects, open source projects that were very code-centric, very individual company-centric, and more diffuse projects. And what I've noticed is that projects that are driven by people working full-time at a single company together, uh, you know, they have their own workplace camaraderie, pretty much always have blind spots. And uh, one thing that I noticed, and you can sort of, you can see this as like a tell if you're looking at an open source project. If you see that a project is taking special pains to, you know, quote unquote, get feedback from the community, they say, they think of their own project, themselves, the core team, and then the community is a separate entity that they have to get feedback from. That's, I think, a tell that something not quite right is happening, and that there's a distinction between the core team and the community. And when you have a core team that is diffuse, that has many, many different interests, and uh, where a lot of the work just naturally happens on GitHub because that's where the collaboration happens, you get this natural sense of the community is part of us. We are, we are part of the community. The community is part of us. And that also means that there's like a wider and wider circles of involvement. So there's a bunch of people that are close to being on the core team and a, a bigger group of people that are being very active and contributing. And there's not really any clear, sharp line like there would be if you were doing open source at a big company. So that's sort of one sort of diversification. And another kind of diversification that I think is really important is I've noticed that a lot of core teams are composed entirely of people working on the core code. And just like you can have a blind spot if everybody's working at the same company, it's really easy to have blind spots if everybody's working just on code. Um, this is something that I noticed when I got involved early in jQuery. I was really impressed by how easily John Rezig, the creator, gave people who were talented in other areas, not code, like evangelism, producing content, event planning, how much he gave them full autonomy over those parts of the project. And this is something that I brought to Ember, really bringing people involved in, on the core team who are not necessarily going to be doing the hardcore code work, but who are doing uh, really important parts of the project and giving them full autonomy and authority over that area. And what this means in practice um, is that the core team of jQuery and also Ember includes perspectives that are just simply absent in other projects that I've been involved in. When you make an important decision, for example, something like Ember 2.0, the actual decision involves a lot more than just what exact code you're writing. And giving these 
people with real talents in these functional areas a seat at the table, it makes the planning a lot more effective. So like I said, I followed John's lead on this when I started Ember, and just recently when we did the Ember 2.0 plan, I, I noticed that it really paid dividends. So Ember 2.0 was actually not really mostly about code. A lot of things are about code, but it also involved big discussions about documentation. How do we transition the documentation to the new, uh, the new plan? Um, how to time the, the Ember 2.0 announcement relative to EmberConf? So we make sure that we have the biggest impact. And uh, how do we change the automation so that the automation deals with some changes in what we're doing? And these are all areas where in a lot of projects that I've been involved in, people doing those things will sort of get delegated responsibility once the core team decides what to do. But having everybody at the table who does all these individual roles be part of the wheeling and dealing and the back and forth that goes into figuring out what exactly you're doing was really great. And I think if you just look at the Ember 2.0 announcement, you can see that we, by the time we announced it, we had a really well thought through um, answer for a lot of what we were doing that took into consideration a lot of a lot of different constituencies and a lot of different functional areas. And this ended up being great. So there are real benefits, I think, to diversifying your core team. Um, but obviously, diversification doesn't come without some challenges. And I think the, the maybe one of the biggest ones is that it's very easy for people who work together at one company to have a sense of the long-term vision for a project because you're working together with people every day and everybody's sitting around, you go to lunch together, you have internal company chat rooms, you're part of a bigger discussion with maybe other groups that are using your thing. And so it's really easy to have a sense of where you're going. Um, a diversified core team really has to spend some energy thinking about how to keep your eye on the ball. It's really easy for you to have a lot of different people and every individual person is doing, uh, has their own priorities and doesn't necessarily at, just naturally think about the big picture vision of the whole thing. So. It's really important for a diversified core team to make sure that even though everybody has different priorities, the whole group has a sense of what the shared priorities. What does everyone agree with? Why are we all here together, sitting around at a table, talking about the same thing, even though we're all at different companies with different uh, requirements? And so we at the Ember team do a few different things to try to deal with this. Um, we have an internal uh, chat room. I think most core teams end up having a private chat room just for you know chatting. <laughs> Um, but the Ember core team also, in addition to chatting uh, off the cuff, we try to do most sort of planning, um, code planning in the public Ember.js dev uh, room. But there's sort of an internal chat so we can make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, we also do weekly calls. Um, weekly calls involve things like making decisions about whether an RFC is accepted or not, whether a particular feature flag is going to be goad or no goad, and that gives us an opportunity to continuously renew our, our general understanding of what it is that we're doing. And we also have quarterly face-to-face -face meetings where everyone can get together and just uh, talk in person and have a really high bandwidth communication about what the big picture roadmap is. And that's really an opportunity for everyone to come together and say, okay, I'm working on mobile, so we have this really bad performance issue that we want to make sure it gets addressed. How does that fit into the Ember 2.0 plan? Right? So everyone getting together and having high bandwidth conversations. I think, in general, um, open source projects tend to undervalue high bandwidth communications because we're so good at talking on IRC or talking on chat um, that people forget that sometimes just being in the same room together with another person can be very effective. Um, so this is something that you sort of get for free being at a, at a big company doing full-time work that you have to try to backfill. But I think it, the benefits are clearly worth it. Um, I think you can see from the Ember 2.0 plan that the combination of having a diffuse set of interests with this, these occasional sync ups to make sure everyone's on the same page produces very strong plans. Um, so in light of all that, a lot of people often say to me, so it seems like the idea of a PDFL, Benevolent Dictator for Life, is kind of pointless. Like, why is this not just a consensus-driven process that the community uh, handles um, or that the core team handles? What is the point of having like somebody who's quote unquote in charge? And so what I've realized from having done open source a few times and having seen company, uh, having seen projects that were made up of a bunch of different people is that the best, most important role of a BDFL is just to make sure that the core team is actually paying attention to the long-term vision and talking about shared goals. Because again, it's really easy for any individual core contributor to get really um, super over-rotated, super interested in their particular interest. And it's really important that those interests are represented. But Having somebody who's, whose job in the project is just to make sure that when people bring up some issue, they're, everybody's thinking about it in terms of the bigger picture, ends up being really important. So keep making sure the team considers new ideas, new plans, new thoughts in terms of the big picture, I think is the primary role of the BDFL. And maybe a secondary uh, role is open source projects are, uh, get under a lot of attack. So Twitter, Hacker News, you can people throw a lot of, of stuff at you. 
And having someone who whose job it is to essentially say, okay, guys, we're, you know, here's the long-term plan. We all agreed to this plan. We're not going to let some y Yahoo on Hacker News uh, derail us and make us panic, basically avoiding panic, giving, making sure everybody feels like we're all in this together, keeping everybody having a sense of camaraderie, I think ends up being a really important role for the BDFL. Just, again, just making sure that everybody has their eye on the, on the big picture and that everybody is not freaking out, not panicking, not allow, allowing the, mo the things that happen every day to divert, to push you away from the direction that you're going in. And this is actually, both of these things are a really hard job, and um, personally, I try not to do this job alone. This is the reason I work with Tom, is that on any given day, one of the two of us might have been really affected by something somebody said on Twitter, but the other one could usually be counted on to give the other one a pep talk. So uh, I think shouldering the burden of, of BDFL, of keeping everybody on track, uh, avoiding panic, keeping an eye on the ball. It's something that can really weigh on you over time. I've done it before on other projects, and having a pair, I think, is really helpful. So really, with all that I just said, the core idea of what I'm calling indie open source is humility. Uh, instead of imagining that one company can figure out all the answers ahead of time and then go off into a cave and toil away for months and months and months to implement them, or years, indie open source projects prefer to have a lot of people working together on shared solutions discovered in the process of building real applications. And I think these are two really different ways of doing things. The, I've done, like I said, I've done, I did Rails 3. I did the, let's come up with a big idea and then spend 18 months implementing it. And it's, it just really has a different uh, flavor and a different success profile from the idea of having a bunch of people that are always building, always adding new value, which naturally in, leads in general to a far more incremental pace of development. Um, since everyone's working on real applications, right? everybody on the Ember core team, everyone pretty much on the Rails core team is working on real applications, every new change that you do really has to pay its way. Um, this doesn't necessarily mean that you can never break anything, but it does mean that a breaking change has a high bar to clear in order for everyone to agree that the benefits are worth it. Because even though I might find that there's a lot of value in me doing something for my own personal project, if I'm working with a bunch of other people working on a lot of projects, Everybody has to agree that, yeah, this is good. It'll either will help with adoption, it will help a lot of projects, it will, it's important for some particular use case that we agree is representative. But we, don't get a, we can't get away with just sort of willy-nilly going off and doing these huge boil the ocean uh, changes. And one funny thing about this is I, when you use the word incremental, it sort of sounds like slow or stodgy or maybe you're hunting for the local maximum. Um, but the funny thing is that usually when people talk about, about breaking all the time, what they say is, you know, it used to be that the web was super slow. And because the web was super slow and nothing changed a lot, we could get away with these projects that never broke anything. You know, jQuery doesn't break things, and that's fine because the web doesn't change. But now what, we've ha what has happened is that the web is changing tremendously. Every month, every year, it's totally different. So we really need to break our frameworks all the time to take into consideration, take advantage of these changes. And the sort of funny thing to me as a person who works on standards is that the web is sort of a counterexample to this entire point. The web it shows that you can make big changes. I can still go to spacejam.com on my on the newest Chrome and still have a 1995 website work today. And this is something that the web has shown that you can do by working incrementally, by being very disciplined about adding new features um, with really epic compatibility constraints, really. You can still make changes that feel really fast and really revolutionary and ironically are being used to justify the exact opposite strategy. And what this means in practice is that Big Bang rewrites, when you have a bunch of people sitting around the table with real applications and real needs and uh, desires to add real features, Big Bang rewrites pretty much almost never clear the hurdle. Um, it's very tempting, especially if you aren't yourself maintaining a long-term app, to do it. And, the tech and technical debt is a real thing. It really hurts when you have it. But when you're working on real apps with a bunch of people, when you have 10 people sitting in a room, everybody with their own set of real apps, and you have a big community of people that are helping to contribute all with their own real apps, you realize quickly that you, if you're going to make a big change, you've got to bring everybody along. And a total rewrite pretty much by definition means breaking your community in half. And you can sort of see the effects of breaking your community in half with Python 3. If you end up breaking your community in half, one really bad side effect is that the core team, the people working on the future, base no longer represent the way the community actually uses the project. So you have a, a community that doesn't know how to move to the new thing for whatever reason. Um, this is a pretty common problem. And then you have a core team that's super excited about the, the latest and greatest, and that core team is now even further disconnected than they were before from the community. So uh, a benefit of just having everybody 
having the community and the core team essentially be made out of the same stuff, out of the same cloth, everybody's working on apps together, is that you, you don't have a way to pull out and be totally disconnected. Um, and when you're thinking about how to make changes, when you're thinking about making a, a, either an incremental change or maybe even a bigger change, I think Ember 2 is a, has some big changes in it, it's important to think about the fact that there's going to be a transition period where the community has one hand in the future and one hand in the past. And you need to think about how to move people across. So um, one thing that's great about project ecosystems like Ember or Rails or Python or Ruby is that there's a pretty big package ecosystem. And the package ecosystem can help. right? So you can have an add-on. For example, in Rails, uh, there's an authentication add-on called Devise. And Devise really works hard to make sure that Devise for Rails 3 works on Rails 4 and Rails 5 um, with the same API. So this can help. This can help smooth the process. Um, and get people to move along incrementally, a little at a time, as they are able to. Um, but you, in order to make this work, you really do need to think about how that's, how packages are going to be able to pull that off. And I think Python 3, if you dig into the details, a lot of what didn't work so well was that they didn't think a lot about how to make sure that the package ecosystem could write things that would help people move along, that would work in both Python 2 and then with the same API in Python 3. There were just syntactic changes. There were big changes that made that impossible. And uh, for another talk that I'll give someday, I think this stands in stark contrast to how Ruby incrementally did Ruby 1.9 and, and helped the, and the package ecosystem help move things along. So I talked a little bit about Big Bang releases versus incrementalism. And when we shipped 1.0 about a year ago, we knew that we wanted to avoid big releases that fragment the community. And we realized that uh, we looked at Chrome. We realized that the browser sort of gave us a roadmap for how to do this. And so. We have to come up with some stuff because the browser has a total, uh, is essentially semver locked at 1.x, right? It can never release at 2.0. So we have to think about the bigger picture. And so a combination of um, semantic versioning, which meant not breaking things uh, in 1.x, 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, and releasing every six weeks like clockwork basically gave us a roadmap for getting the community to be able to upgrade without fear. So people could go, when we release 1.8, a huge percentage of the community is on 1.8 within a, a week or two. And what this means in practice is that we, because we release every six weeks and people are upgrading, we can roll out big changes a little piece at a time. And we can roll out the big changes mostly in a compatible way with the last version, or pretty much entirely a compatible way lately. And just to give you a sense of it, the process, sorry, I have, um, the process that I'm talking about here is, if you're not familiar with the Chrome process, is that pretty much you do all your work on master. So you, every day people are just committing new stuff. And then every new feature, every time you add a new feature, you say, OK, this feature is called uh, you know, new router query params. This is an example of a feature that lasted for a long time. And the core team every so often takes a look at these features that have landed on the master branch and decides that they're ready to become stable. And this has a pretty awesome effect of letting people who are really excited and interested in doing latest and greatest work, lets them work on nightly, lets them work with new features, give feedback, make sure things are stable before you get it done. And then over time, as you move into the beta channel and the stable channel, people who are more interested in stability, which tends to be most people, um, get features that are rock solid, that are well thought out, that are um, a little piece at a time incremental. Um, they, get, they get benefits out of that. So I think this ends up being great. It means, in practice, that our community, Ember, as a whole, is very fast to adopt improvements to idioms. You sort of think that incremental, incrementalism means you can't switch big things, but we've actually moved from mostly a globals-based ecosystem to mostly a module-based ecosystem without breaking changes through little incremental changes a piece at a time. And because these changes can be absorbed a little bit at a time in a largely compatible way, this means that people can act, can make the shift without, you know, in a sprint. They can say, in this sprint, I'll schedule upgrading to Ember 1.8, and then they're a little bit moved ahead. And then the next time, they'll upgrade to Ember 1.9 and be a little bit ahead. And when I talk about humility, the humility in indie open source is not just about getting a wide variety of perspectives, getting a lot of people. Um, it's also about not assuming that you could design a solution ahead of time, that you can sit, sit in a room, write a bunch of design documents, uh, sit in front of a whiteboard with a group of people, come up with a perfect solution, and then spend a year implementing it. Again, I've been there. Um, instead, we make changes a little at a time. This is the idea behind Indie Open Source. You're making changes a little at a time, and you're getting feedback from the whole community, um, the core team, but also the big community at large as you go. Because you need to go a little at, if you go a little bit at a time, and you make a mistake with Step one, you have time to pivot. If you wrote a bunch of design documents that seemed awesome in theory, and then you go to implement, and a year later you finally ship something, it's really hard to, to make changes. You might have made huge mistakes, and you can't 
you, know, you can't make changes. You also can't respond to contextual shifts that happen as you're going. Um, so instead of asking our users, this is sort of a diagram of minimum viable product, and I, for me it was like sort of an epiphany when I saw it. Instead of asking our users to try out barely functional features that can take months or years to build, we should be building smaller, more incremental, and more evolutionary features that are fully fledged out. They're functional, they're reliable, they're usable, and they feel like they're, they work. They feel emotionally good. And when we do that, we have evolutionary features that our users can try out quickly and inform the future of the design. Because we don't get to say, when you start with the left side, when you start with just barely functional, you get to say, oh, the reason you're having trouble is it's not done yet. But if you start with a fully fledged out slice of the whole MVP, you know, a slice on the left, you don't really get to say that. You learn very quickly whether the solution is working or not. So again, the idea here is humility. We just don't know what we don't know. So if we have a year to work on something, going one step, uh, if we have a year to work on something, we're actually going to have not, we're, we're not going to succeed very effectively. But if we go a step at a time with a full, with fully fleshed out stable increments, we're going to get a lot further. Um, and I think the idea is not just don't pray that you got it right the first time. Actually, have a plan for for pivoting, for doing the right thing, for being sort of humble about what we know and what we can do. And but if you th heard what I just said, maybe a thing that you're thinking is. Um, you're doing incremental changes, how do you keep track of the big picture? And so I think none of this really means that you can't have your eye on the horizon. Um, Ember, a couple years ago, made pretty big bets on ES6 modules. We made pretty big bets on promises, and we made pretty big bets on Ember CLI. And if you look at Ember 2.0, all that stuff came together. But we didn't, we didn't say, we're going to build Ember CLI, and you know, a year from now, it'll be done, and it'll be ready for use, and we'll build it along that time. We built Ember CLI a little bit at a time. The first Ember CLI was Ember AppKit, and it was so... Uh, so much of an MVP that the first logo was sort of like a cartoonish person, uh, Tomster juggling a bunch of uh, a bunch of pieces of functionality, very crudely drawn, just to show how how early it was. So we started with very crude, very early stuff, and we slowly incremented towards it. We started with some basic uses of promises and added more and more uses of promises over time as things became useful. Um, we didn't make everybody move to ES6 modules all at once. So this has allowed us to have big picture goals. We sort of know where we're going with things, but we don't. We're not getting lost in a multi-year refactoring exercise. Um, there's something just amazingly grounding about the discipline of having to ship new features every six weeks. When you have to ship a feature, when you have to ship something every six weeks, you have to take these huge ideas. This like I think everybody should be on a centralized build tool and use ES6 modules. You have to think about how to break that down into little pieces that people can um, move towards a little bit at a time. And yes, that definitely requires discipline, and it definitely requires uh, thinking carefully about community management and adoption. But what that means is that the community is part of what you're doing, and everybody is sort of in it together. So in the open source, fundamentally, is about acknowledging human frailty. We diversify our teams and work on real apps so we don't rely too much on any one person or any one company being right all the time or having insights out of whole cloth. We don't rely on uh, mad scientists, geniuses, or one company being the perfect company that has thought of all the answers. And we make changes a little bit at a time so we don't rely too much on any one big idea, no matter how much we might like it. If you, if you spend a year working on a big idea, you basically get one big idea. And if it works, it works. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Making changes a little bit at a time means you diversify the set of things you're betting on. You get to make some mistakes and still succeed. Um, so really what this means is that we prefer to avoid single points of failure, as entrancing as single points of failure might feel. We don't want to have too big to fail ideas or too big to fail companies. So what does concretely this mean uh, for you if you're watching this talk? So it means if you're working on open source, you should diversify your teams right away so that decision making isn't in the hands of one company. Think of too many open source projects have decision making that just happens for whatever historical reason happens to be centralized in one company and diversifying your team and giving people autonomy and authority both in terms of individual companies and in terms of uh, and in terms of functional areas so that there's decision making that's diffused across a big area I think that's one really important thing another important thing is spend at least a day every week if you're working on open source ideally more than a day if you can do it working on a real application that you care about and maintain I think people tend to think that their time is a zero-sum game. So they think, well, I'm working 40 hours a week on open source. If I spend eight hours working on an app, that's eight hours I couldn't work on open source. But my experience is that it's not a zero-sum game. And the, uh, the, prog the faster progress that you can make because of the fact that you have better prioritization 
ends up more than paying for eight hours or 16 hours or even 20 hours a week doing a project. It really helps you focus on what ends up mattering instead of spending potentially months and months and months on something that doesn't matter. So if you imagine spending you know, 20 hours on something that's crucially important versus three months on something that's less important, even though that's less time, it may end up being a lot more valuable, and I found that it is. Um, also, open the core teams of your project to people who primarily work with as opposed to on your project. So this is something that I think I've noticed a lot of people, they don't want to have people on the core team that they don't feel are writing the core code every day and are like sort of have their hands dirty. But having your project's customers, people who are using your product every day, uh, as people who are sitting around the table and may helping make decisions, that makes sure that you're not, your, your perspective is not too skewed by your knowledge of the implementation, right? So, and I don't mean just pick a random person from your community and say, you are now on the core team. Clearly, we want people that are either very active in, in the community, they seem to know what they're talking about, you want people who understand the vision, who have a good perspective on things, but uh, people who, who are primarily engaged in the act of using your product in a, in a really advanced, awesome way, bring a lot of value to your team. And finally, when you're planning for the future, when you're thinking about what's, what's 2.0 of my open source project, um, choose a lot of small changes spread out over time that you can do ideally in a compatible way for the most part instead of making one really big change. Uh, thank you very much. Great presentation, Yehuda. That was very, very interesting. Um, and while you've been presenting, uh, we've done a few polls of the audience. And we can poll them more if you want uh, to ask any questions you want. Um, so let me know if you want any polls done. Uh, but if you click over the polls tab, you'll see what's been asked. So uh, we're, we're finding out where's everyone kind of uh, video conferencing in from today. So it's all over the world, including six from Antarctica, which I highly doubt, but uh, <laughs> it's possible, I guess. Um, and we actually, about one out of every uh, 15 people or so is actually frequently contributing to open source. Um, and most people in the audience have made open source contributions, actually. Uh, in some, one form or another, which is pretty cool. We've got a pretty advanced audience here, Yehuda. Sweet. And then yes. uh, what role do you occupy in your team? Most, most, uh, most folks are actually in the trenches programming. They're either a dev lead or a line developer. Um, architects came out as a third, third highest. And then uh, most, most frequently used JavaScript framework, Angular came in first, followed by Ember and then Backbone. And yeah, I'm not surprised my people are here. <laughs> and then how many projects do you normally finish? Uh, the most common answer is most of the projects get finished, Second, followed by some of them, and then very few people said all of their projects actually get finished. So any thoughts on any of that stuff? You do? Yeah, so I think the most interesting of these questions for me is how often do you contribute to open source projects uh, less than I would like to. The thing that's interesting about that is it seems like that means that people would like to contribute but can't. Uh, and I think uh, probably a thing you should do sort of on the topic of my talk is try to find projects that operate in this kind of indie way where the community is not a separate thing from the core project. Because I, we've had so many people in the Ember project that have become very, very active contributors who essentially, we had a person who was on paternity leave and he pinged Igor on Ember Data and said, I have some time. And Igor looked at him and said, okay, you seem smart. And he started giving him tasks that he thought would be relatively simple. And that person did them. And now he's really active. He's super active. Uh, doing so much work. His name is Weck, W-E-C-C -C on IRC. Um, so I would say w projects where people, are, the project itself is pretty time constrained, but there's also this notion of the, op the core team is doing apps and is part of the community, has a much better on-ramp for contributions. And that's not to say that any, uh, working on any real open source project has some learning to do. you got to figure out how to build the thing and what the CI server is going to do and all this kind of stuff. But uh, a project where the community is really driving the project, and I don't mean in words, I mean in reality and practice because that's the composition of the core team, will probably be a better a better way for you to make small changes and people will have a better sense of where the time constraints are and what the most valuable stuff is. So if you're things. interested, definitely look for stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm kind of wondering something, Yehuda. In your experience, obviously, you know, you're working with a large number of contributors and they look up to you for leadership. Um, have you ever had challenges kind of motivating and keeping everyone on track to hit a specific deadline, given that these folks are not being compensated. They're doing it out of the, out of the goodness of their heart because they believe in, in the mission and the vision. How do you do that? Because you know, with, with traditional organizations, you know, you've got a salary structure in place. People might lose their jobs if they're not actually you know, really contributing. How do you manage all that in a volunteer-based organization like an open source project? Well, I think this is actually also a counterintuitive thing. 
Uh, although I think historically the answer that people give to this question is it will be done when it's ready, and I've never liked that answer. I've always found it to be extremely glib, and Ember just doesn't run that way at all. Um, but I think it's counterintuitive. I think you think that if you're at a company, you are forced to ship on time. But actually, if you look at open source projects that come out of companies, they have the same kinds of problems of it will ship when it's ready and never actually doing things. Uh, when we shipped Ember 1.0, I, I don't mean never doing anything. I mean not uh, not necessarily moving as quickly and efficiently as you would expect. Um, I, I kind of think of this as a, a seeming paradox. If you look at the Ember 1.0 plan, basically what me and Tom did is we said, August 31st is when we're shipping Ember 1.0, and we said that publicly, and then about a week before, we just said, hey, community, I know you guys are all really busy, and we don't ask for this a lot, but maybe you could uh, come for the next week, and really, here's a big list of checklist items that we don't think we're necessarily going to all get to on the core team. Maybe you could come help do some. Um, I, I, don't, I can't bring up the link immediately, but I think Tom had a couple of quotes, like quotes from Steve Jobs, like real artist ship, and then there was, I think when we finally did it, he posted a thing about, uh, from Teddy Roosevelt about being battered and beaten on the battlefield, right? So there's definitely some motivation that you have to do, but I think communities where people don't feel like, you know, oh, you're working on it full time, why don't you just do it? If it's... Well, everybody's working on apps. People have it's a volunteer project. I think I think even corporate open source projects like to talk the talk about being a volunteer project, but it's not real, right? Ember is really a volunteer project, which means it's it's kind of easy to tell the community like, hey, here's the thing we want to do. Here's why we're resource constrained. Um, if you if you really care about that, do this. Um, I, DHH taught me a really awesome thing really early, which is you really want people who are working on a feature to be the people that will use it and care about it. And if you try to work on or build a feature that you think in theory is good, but you don't really feel in your gut, you end up doing a bad job. So having community members saying like, okay, here's the big picture vision, let me find community members that are interested, ends up being good. Um, but yeah, I, I think in answer to your original question, which is just like, how do you keep people motivated? I think I think it just naturally, if, you, if you're a good BDFL that's part of the community that, you, that sort of came out of, you know, you do your work on GitHub, you're submitting pull requests, you're, uh, when you have questions that you want to discuss, you uh, you do it in a public place because that's where everybody is. It's sort of the keeping people motivated towards a vision naturally falls out of that process, assuming that there's somebody um, who knows it. Right? So if well, somebody knows the vision... Is that by having transparency and open communication, you're involving everyone in group decision making, and everyone feels like they're part of the team. Yeah, so I don't think you, sh I don't think you should necessarily think of it as group decision making, but I think you should think of it as... Um, there's circles of involvement. The core team is the people that have shown historically that they have a very good understanding of the vision and ability to apply the vision to essentially arbitrary problems. Then there's uh, people who are essentially probably going to be core eventually and then uh, really active community members and sort of circles out. And I think the idea is, is more about making sure that people who are super active are part of the process. But at the end of the day, the point of the core team is to actually make the call, right? So. I sort of, I, in, one, in one sense, the core team has a big role, but in the other sense, the core team role, in my view, is pretty narrow. It's like, it's basically go or, a lot of little go or no-go decisions about individual features with the idea that you, the reason you're making those calls is because you have a sense of the, the overall vision and you're deciding whether things fit. And within the core team, is there a hierarchy or like is it is a decision by unanimous vote? How are those tough decisions made when there's contention? Yeah, so, so on, the, on one hand, I think when there's real contention that you can't get past, I think the BDFL person, which sometimes doesn't is not officially BDFL, but you sort of know who the person with the most moral authority is in the project, uh, usually that person, it doesn't, it's not like they get to make a decision. They don't say, I am voting for this, and therefore it wins. But everybody kind of knows that the people with the most moral authority will break ties if there's too much contention. Um, but, I, but that's not really how it works. I think the way it ends up working is that people defer to people whose hands are dirty. So if there's, if there's, in most cases where people aren't sure if they agree with something, if somebody's actively involved, so for example, Chris does a lot of work with performance, Steph does a lot of work with performance, I may have some doubts, I may look at something and say, you know, that seems like a micro-optimization, I don't know if that really ends up mattering, but if Steph says to me, look, I did some benchmarks and it seems good, I'm not going to spend too much time arguing with him, he's basically responsible. And similarly, even non-code areas like Leia runs, um, EmberConf, and 
Robert Jackson does a lot of infrastructure automation. If Leia comes to me and, and says, okay, we're doing EmberConf, and I say, oh, that signage looks silly, basically I don't, that's not a thing that I'm going to spend too much time arguing about. So I think the answer really is that uh, this, is, this is a TC39 thing, uh, which is the JavaScript committee that I learned, which is that you really want a champion model where you're mostly investing the hard day-to-day -day work to a smaller group that can actually get their hands dirty and do stuff, and then only the question of whether or not the thing fits in with the bigger picture of, of the long-term vision is a question for the core team. Um, and and it, it, there definitely are contentious topics, but I think it's not like Congress. If you're on the Ember core team, it means you already have a sense of the vision, so getting to a point where everyone can come to an agreement, I, I don't want to sound utopian like everybody is sitting around, and yes, everybody agrees there have been a lot of real arguments, but everybody knows what the goal is, and the goal is we want to ship Ember 2.0 and have more users, right? So it's it's difficult. It's not easy for contention to deadlock because people know that you have to do something. You have to make some progress. Makes a lot of sense. All right, one last question for me, then we'll toss it over to the audience here. Um, so have you ever considered for any of the, the open source projects you're working on the, the idea of making an enterprise version of any of them? And, and you know, like, obviously there's a, there's a monetization temptation there to see, you know, can I actually make a business off of this repository? Now, what I was wondering is, you know, did that decision process ever ever enter your mind? Why did you make or not make that decision? And then also, if, if for any of the open source repositories you've seen that have done that, how do they tend to, to, to deal with the, the kind of the political issues between dividing up, you know, kind of the, the finances among all these different contributors who have been part of that repo to begin with? You have just explained why I don't, why the answer is no. Um, but uh, I think the bigger point is, for me, one of the high, like the high order bit for open source is everybody's doing the same thing. So, and DHH um, in I think 2008 gave a talk about Rails and he said something about beginners where he said everybody's climbing the same mountain together. And I, that really appeals to me, the idea that there aren't like turbo buttons for advanced users and like easy bake oven versions for beginners and then like the enterprise version for big teams with who go slow, but there's like an ecosystem of people that are generally using the same tools, they're using the same Ember Inspector and the same Ember CLI, and we can make it work. If you're progressive enough as a big company to use Ember, we can make it work for you. We, we're not gonna ignore your needs, but we don't need to go off and do a separate thing. I think, so like MySQL did this, where they had like MySQL enterprise add-ons or whatever, and I think that, that just bifurcated the community, right? It's, you're either paying a lot of money and you're special, you get the special tools or you get the, the bad tools. So for me, I would never do anything that compromises the idea that everybody in the ecosystem is, has a shared set of tools. And, I, and I, I think the second thing you said is also important, which is as soon as you start, as soon as you have an organization and the job of the organization is to take a big pot of money and distribute it, you go from having a shared sense of consensus and, and shared goals to being a political body. And being a political body is terrible. I've been part of open source projects that have devolved into political bodies, and it's there are projects I just don't enjoy being part of. Sometimes I'm part of them because I, I end up, I'm just there, I'm still there. But of avoiding, DHH wrote this great blog post um, that I cite all the time, Why There's No Rails Inc. And the short version of his answer was, you, if you're running an open source project, everybody wins if the open source project is successful and gets adoption. And if instead you're trying to figure out how to shunt some money to one particular organization and shut out a bunch of a bunch of everybody else, that means that you can't have organic growth where somebody decides to start a Rails consulting company or decides to start Rails third-party products because they're always afraid that they need to license that or whatever. So for me, the, the two things are people should, you, you want to be building the same tools that everyone uses and you want to avoid devolving to politics. And so for me, having an enterprise product or having uh, a big organization that takes a bunch of money and shunts it around doesn't work. Um, there is a, a, a strategy. If people tell me that they want to fund Ember, usually what I say is, um, hey, there's an, a member of the core team who has some free bandwidth. You can either you can fund them or their consulting company that they're part of. Or maybe you maybe there's somebody in your company that you can give some time, maybe 20% time or 50% time, to work on something that matters to you. So again, this is about taking what, in theory, might feel like it needs to be centralized funding and trying to diffuse it across a bigger group of people that can grow organically and not have to worry about the politics of it. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks, Yehuda. Okay, let's toss it over to the audience. Uh, the question with the most votes, 234 votes from 
Ashray KS Bot. Ashray, congratulations. You will win a one-hour mentoring session with one of the participating speakers uh, after the conference is over as part of Hack.Pledge. So Ashray's question is, Angular, Ember, and Backbone, which should a beginner choose? Which one is easy? Which one is the best? Obviously, kind of a loaded question for you, Yehuda, but feel free to answer. Um, so I, I think open source frameworks are interesting um, in the sense that it's really, I think people ha- want to have, they want to order things in order, like good, better, best. They want to say, like, this one is the best and this one is better. And I, I, but I think on the other hand, a lot of people have the idea that they're all the same. Like, there's a million open source frameworks, uh, MVC frameworks, and they're all the same, or there's a million and they're all the same except for the one that I like, and that one is, is like a million times better. It's like clearly the only right way to do things. Um, and I'll say sort of my philosophy on this is that many solutions are contextual. So there's a lot of people that go around and they say, I have found the one true solution. It's promises, it's channels, it's transducers, it's whatever. And I, I don't have a lot of time for those, those things because really the solution to any problem is very is very contextual. And I don't mean this vague uh, notion of like find the best tool for the job and just try a bunch of stuff out. I mean that there are certain contexts in which certain tools or certain ideas are actually better than others. Let me give you one uh, general example and then I'll try to answer the question. A general example is you can write code that's very coupled and you can write code that's very decoupled. Um, An example of this is callbacks versus events. So when you write a a piece of code with callbacks, the code that, that made the request has to also be the code that handles the response. So that's very coupled. And so a lot of people have this notion, this big notion, like, I don't like coupling. Coupling is bad. We should do everything with events. Everything should be events. And events is a very decoupled idea. You make an event, and somebody else handles it. But the thing about events is that when you use a decoupled strategy, you're, you're, forced, into, uh, you're forced into a solution that drops errors or is quieter about errors or is uh, less less obvious about errors. So when people say it feels magical, it feels like I don't really know what's going on, usually what they mean is that they're using a decoupled solution. And sometimes decoupled solutions are great. If you if you don't actually know who's listening on the other side, if you have a separation between your model and your view, and you don't necessarily want your model to have to know about the view, decoupled solutions are great. But there are other cases where you are you have a parent and child component, and they're talking to each other, and you, can't, you want to get an error if the parent didn't give you a callback to call, right? The fact that you might be using an event system, and the the event didn't go anywhere, and it just silently didn't do anything. Or this is a lot often true about data bindings. That doesn't work well if you if you know for sure what you're trying to do. So this is just a, a sort of microcosm example where people feel like you know you have people that are like callbacks are always good. People are like events are always good. And I sort of think it really depends on how um, how coupled together the two pieces of the system are. If the pieces of the system are talking about things that are conceptually close together that know about each other already, then you don't want to use a decoupled solution because you'll, you'll lose errors. But if you're talking about two parts of the system that need to evolve separately that don't know about each other, maybe you're willing to pay a little bit of debugging cost in exchange for better architecture. So uh, I sort of think the same thing in the macro level. I think Ember, Ember is definitely a tool that's designed for people that are building whole apps that want to that want to share an ecosystem with a lot of people that have similar ideas, and I think people have this weird idea that if everybody's sharing a solution, that means it has to be stodgy and it can't evolve. And I think that's clearly wrong. Like Ember's the Ember was the first framework that adopted ES6 modules, and it was a very early adopter of Promises, and we're probably the first framework that uses use Promises very aggressively. You can you can take a group and say, okay, here's the decision. We support WebSockets, for example. I think people. Uh, I mean, Rails never did, but Ember kind of did from the beginning just because of our architecture. So I think people have this weird idea. But Ember is really good if a lot of if you have a lot of people in a community that want to share ideas and you want to you want to be part of that. You want to be part of the idea that there's a set of solutions that everyone is working on together. And frankly, number one, there are projects where that's inappropriate for because you actually are doing something out of the wheelhouse. And there are people for whom that is inappropriate. There are people that really like to get their hands dirty and know the whole stack. Um, I think there are a few teams that will succeed at that strategy. There are a few teams that will succeed by having one guy sitting around and that one guy is like, okay, I'm making the whole framework because you get new people coming on all the time and they're like, oh, now we have some in-house framework. That guy eventually leaves. Now everybody's stuck with it. I've I've been there. Um, But I think there are definitely individuals and there are definitely really innovative uh, cases where you want to have the freedom to do sort of whatever you want. Um, Although I think components sort of help allow you to do whatever you want in the context of a bigger framework. So I think I think Ember works really well if you want to be part of that 
And th and that's the thing. I think people when people say monolithic, they're not really they think they're talking about the architecture. The architecture is actually pretty modular. What they're talking about is that you have to opt into being part of a thing, being part of a group of people that are sharing ideas. Um, I, think, I think it's it's a very good point you're making, especially about the debugging costs of having loosely coupled systems. Because I remember like when I was first learning to program in Node, uh, the whole kind of callback event driven kind of nature of it made it very very difficult for me at first to understand how to debug those kinds of systems. Over time, what kinds of best practices? have you learned about how to debug in a loosely coupled system like that? So there, there's kind of two answers. One of the answers is do less loosely coupled stuff. So I think React may be overcompensated, but definitely made a really good point here, which is when you're talking between two components and one of them is a child and one of them is a parent, the idea that you're loosely coupled is nonsense. So stop using loosely coupled things. Just use callbacks, and if you call a callback and it didn't, you didn't pass it, you will get an error, and that's good. You want that. So that's one strategy. Um, another strategy is, and this is something we care a lot about about the Ember Inspector, is you want to really have debugging tools that are at the abstraction level of your domain. So when you use React or Angular or Ember or any of these tools, you're actually dealing with a higher level of abstraction. Just like when you're using Ruby, Ruby's implemented in C, but you're not thinking in terms of C. You wouldn't want to go and use a debugging tool that was like, here is the struct in C that represents this Ruby object. And similarly, you don't really want to be using a debugging tool that's like, here is the internal metadata structure inside of this POJO that React is using. You want a higher level thing, so uh, or, or Angular or Ember or whatever. Um, so the Ember Inspector is designed to be a debugging tool that operates at the level of abstraction of Ember. And that at least lets you see, like, OK, here are all the objects that actually exist. So you have singletons, right? And it's like, what are they? And so the inspector will tell you, here's all the singletons that are that are alive. Here's how the dependency injection worked. Here is the not just the DOM hierarchy, but here's the view hierarchy. And for each view, here's the objects that are attached to it. And you can click on them, and you can make you can see. Okay, here's the things that are in this view. Here's the Ember inheritance hierarchy. So we have a you know we have an object model that we that like everybody. We have our own object model, and you can see it. Um, and you can go in and look at individual properties. You can change them and see how they affect something. So I th I think part of the idea of, of limiting the feeling of magic is providing and using tools that operate at the level of the abstraction instead of that operate at the level of the the, the underpinnings. Of course, the underpinnings sense. are very magical. Great. I think we're just about out of time here, Yehuda. Is there any final words you'd like to say to our audience before we, we leave for today? So I'll just reiterate what I said at the end, which is I, I, want, I would like us to think more critically about the distinction between what I'm calling indie open source and corporate open source. I think the big corporations have gotten very good at playing open source but they haven't really gotten that good at being part of the community. And I don't mean never use corporate open source. I mean push harder on the, cor the people, the corporations that are running these open source projects to be part of the community, to work on their own pro have individuals that work on their own projects, um, and not have a, you know, a group of people that's isolated, that has lunch together, that make all these decisions. Actually try to diversify. I think it's easier if you're not starting at a big company, and so I, I would suggest that you support projects that are not necessarily working at, out of a big company. But even big company projects, I would suggest try to diversify more and do more incremental steps instead of these big bang changes. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, so Yehuda, I want to thank you so much for being here with us today. I feel very lucky that you joined us. And thank we're very grateful for your participation in enlightening us all about how the internal workings happen within your communities. Um, if you enjoyed what Yehuda said today, then please consider uh, donating to one of the 16 nonprofits that are uh, in the coding space. They support diversity in programming, a lot of them uh, representing minority groups as well as women and other important initiatives for helping programmers in the, in the community. Um, you can do that in the, in the uh, Get Involved tab, which is now highlighted for you. Um, and also, if you enjoyed what Yehuda had to say, please consider checking out his organization, Tilda, as well as Skylight.io, which is his Ruby on Rails performance monitoring uh, tool and, uh, and profiling tool as well. And lastly, I will be posting a link to Yehuda Katz's private Google Hangout. He'll just be available for just a few minutes if anyone has private questions for him. Uh, coming up next, we have Sh Scott Shakan, the Chief Information Officer of GitHub. We'll be back in just a couple minutes with him. He's going to give a fantastic presentation. Hope you all can stay here. We'll be here in a couple minutes. Thanks, Yehuda. Thank you very much.